Today, conspiracy theories abound, and the only clear agreement seems to be that Lee Harvey Oswald was not a lone assassin. Just ahead, we'll take a look at the latest evaluation of the forensic and scientific evidence and see if we can finally discover who killed Kennedy. Those of us who remember that horrible day in November of 1963 find it hard to grasp the reality that there are tens of thousands of Americans who were born, raised, educated, and had their own families after President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. So indelibly is the event locked in our minds that these images seem to have happened only yesterday. But whether you find it to be new information or old news, these next few minutes are going to enlighten, surprise, shock, and perhaps even make you angry. The official version of what happened according to the Warren Commission report is that Lee Harvey Oswald shot President Kennedy from a sniper's position on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, killing Kennedy and wounding Texas Governor John Connolly. From the very day of the assassination, indeed, almost from the very moment, questions were raised about what really happened. According to modern investigators, the Warren Commission report left virtually all of those questions unanswered. The American media, however, have for the most part consistently branded anyone who questions the Warren report as a crackpot or a conspiracy freak. Do they know something they're not telling us? Was Lee Harvey Oswald the lone gunman who shot and killed President Kennedy. According to the Warren Report, Lee Oswald scored two hits firing three shots in six seconds with an Italian-made manlicker Carcano. Not only were master marksmen unable to replicate Oswald's feet, but Oswald's weapon was a medium to low velocity weapon and could not have inflicted the damage to the president's skull. Why did the Warren Commission insist that Oswald somehow accomplished what their own master marksmen were unable to do? The foundation of the Warren Report, of course, is the single bullet theory. The idea that a bullet coming downward passed through Kennedy's neck unhindered and went on to cause all these wounds to Governor John Connolly. This bullet, which was found on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital in a public hallway, was pristine. It was unmarked. And yet, supposedly, it had passed through Kennedy, shattered Connolly's fifth rib and his right wrist. For the same bullet to have hit Governor Connolly, it would have had to change directions and defy the laws of physics. Governor Connolly insisted to his death that he was not hit by the same bullet. If that's so obvious, why didn't the Warren Commission investigators simply eliminate that theory? Could it be because more than one bullet means more than one assassin, hence a conspiracy? Interestingly enough, the Warren Commission interviewed numerous people in Dealey Plaza, except for the most conspicuous ones, such as a man who seemed to be talking on a walkie-talkie, a man pumping an umbrella up and down almost as if a signal, and a man shaking his fist at Kennedy. One of these witnesses that was never contacted by the Warren Commission was a soldier named Gordon Arnold. He told me that he had gone to film the motorcade and then walked up on the grassy knoll and went behind the picket fence when he encountered a man in a suit and tie who he thought was Secret Service and the man ordered him to leave so Gordon went around and stood in front of the fence. Gordon told me that as he stood there watching the motorcade approach, a shot went off right over his left shoulder. Now, he had just completed basic training, and as a soldier, he certainly knew what live ammunition sounded like, and so he immediately hit the ground. Who was the man that Gordon Arnold encountered? Was he really a Secret Service agent? Secret Service officials deny that there were any agents in that area. So what was this man doing behind the fence on the grassy knoll? Many witnesses in Dealey Plaza told of shots from other than the Texas School Book Depository. All this would indicate that Kennedy was shot from the front, not the back. The president's autopsy has been a source of controversy in that regard, which extends to the autopsy x-rays, which were fabricated to conceal a massive blowout to the back of the head caused by a shot fired from in front. Charles Crenshaw, MD, who assisted in treating the president at Parkland Hospital, has described the hole at the back of his head as the size of your fist when you double it up or about as large as a baseball. But the autopsy photographs and the x-rays do not show it. The autopsy record was falsified. These official autopsy photos show JFK's head intact. 
His hair is relatively clean. There's a real absence of blood. And there's only a small red spot to the back rear of his skull. We don't know what happened to the gaping wound in the back of President Kennedy's head that was seen by more than 40 witnesses. The Warren Commission started out with the premise that there was a lone gunman, someone shooting from behind President Kennedy. A gaping wound to the back of his skull would indicate an exit wound or a shot coming from the front. That was unacceptable because it would invalidate the official version and therefore indicate a conspiracy. We now know from John Stringer, the official autopsy photographer, that key photographs taken during the autopsy are missing from the collection in the National Archives. And there's another problem. Some of the photographs in the collection were not developed using the same type of film that Sandra Spencer used to develop the originals at the Naval Photographic Center. She kept samples of that type of film. Could the x-rays and photos from the autopsy have been falsified? And why would the Warren Commission accept the x-rays in spite of vigorous eyewitness testimony contradicting the photos? Dr. Cyril H. Vecht is an experienced coroner and former president of the American Academy of Forensic Medicine. The autopsy on President Kennedy was extremely inadequate. It was inept, incompetent, and superficial by the most modest of standards that would be accepted in a good coroner or medical examiner's office in the United States of America today. The two people in charge at Bethesda, Commander Humes and Commander Boswell, had never done a single medical legal autopsy in their entire careers. The top civilian forensic pathologist in America, well known to the government, utilized by them in many different capacities during and following World War II, were all excluded because of their civilian status and the fact that they could not be counted upon to blindly and uh, passively accept orders from military officers. Is it possible that the horror, shock, and chaos of the event created a momentary lapse among all these professional pathologists? But that explanation doesn't satisfy serious investigators, particularly in the light of the Zapruder film. Abe Zapruder, a bystander, was taking movies as the motorcade came through Daly Plaza. And the film he took has become the center of tremendous controversy, not so much because of what it does show, but because of what it doesn't. After the assassination, the famed Zabruder film was kept from the public until 1975. However, one person outside of government sources who did view the film on the Monday following the assassination was a local television reporter named Dan Rather. After viewing the film, Rather told the public that at the time of the fatal headshot, Kennedy's head moved forward with considerable violence. The film, as we see it today, of course, shows Kennedy's head moving backward, not forward. An especially important event missing from the Zabruder film was the limousine dramatically slowing or coming to a halt, which was reported by more than 59 eyewitnesses to the assassination. The Secret Service denied it, and the film doesn't show it, but during this interval, Jack Kennedy was hit twice in the head, once from behind and once from in front. It's very difficult to hit a moving target. What other reason could there have been for bringing the limousine to a halt? Some skeptics have doubted that the limousine was brought to a halt, but the 10 closest eyewitnesses, including all four motorcycle patrolmen accompanying the limousine, have confirmed it, and it was reported by Time, Newsweek, and United Press International. Dr. David Maddock, Jack White, other photographic experts have intensely studied the Zapruder film and have found evidence that it has been edited. We do know, and it is a matter of record, that several frames were removed at one point in time and subsequently reinserted. So now we have a real question to deal with. Are we seeing the complete Zapruder film? Are there any frames that are missing? Other vital evidence was destroyed on orders of the new president, Lyndon Johnson. Within 72 hours of the assassination, Johnson ordered the presidential limousine totally rebuilt and had an aide pick up Governor Connolly's bloody clothing, which was then cleaned and pressed before being turned over as evidence. Quite apart from accusations of tampering with evidence, there is an even more sinister allegation. Many witnesses in Dealey Plaza claim to have been threatened by agents of the FBI. Was it just their imagination? Or is there evidence that any of these threats were carried out? 
In a three-year period following the deaths of President Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald, 18 material witnesses died. Six were shot. Three were killed in car accidents. Two committed suicide. One had their throat slit. One died from a karate chop to the neck. And only five from what were deemed natural causes. I still remember the fear that was prevalent in Dallas in the mid-60s and how people were whispering about the number of people who died under strange, unusual circumstances. More than 100 people, no matter how indirectly, had died suspiciously. I call them convenient deaths because they're certainly convenient to anyone who's trying to keep the truth of the JFK assassination away from the public. Could it be that all these deaths are just a coincidence? Or was there some kind of conspiracy? Is there any evidence to suggest that members of the FBI or the CIA participated in this appalling act? Is it possible that members of the military and President Kennedy's own government were a part of it? And perhaps the most important unanswered question of all, why? Why did conspirators, or Lee Harvey Oswald for that matter, why did anyone want to get rid of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. All the inconsistencies of the report, altered photographs, conflicting and ignored eyewitnesses, the mind-numbing manipulations of the magic bullet, the sloppy pathology, the rush to clean up the car, all of these things over the years have kept the conspiracy theories coming each one naming a new culprit. Some of these appear ridiculous on their face, but there are others that appear to have merit. There is little question that by the time of the Bay of Pigs invasion, the Central Intelligence Agency was running out of control. Documented CIA abuses include the overthrow of governments and assassination plots. The abuses of the agency horrified President Kennedy. He vowed to smash the CIA into a thousand pieces. When John Kennedy fired CIA Chief Alan Dulles following the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, it sent notice that the times were changing. He further removed all covert military operational control from the CIA and put it under the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a move that seriously weakened the power and prestige of the agency. Now, there were some factions within the CIA that undoubtedly supported President Kennedy, but there were others who made no attempt to hide their contempt for him. This group blamed Kennedy for the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion. Extensive evidence has surfaced indicating Lee Harvey Oswald had worked or was working for the CIA. The question is, was Oswald working for the CIA on November 22, 1963? Or was he being set up as the patsy for the operation? Fletcher Prouty was the chief of special operations of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Kennedy years. Colonel Prouty did extensive study into the Kennedy assassination before he died in early 2001. When Colonel Prouty first read the stories about Lee Oswald, he recognized immediately that a cover story was being put out to the public. Lee Oswald was a designated patsy whether he ever fired at Kennedy or not. When a researcher showed Colonel Prouty some pictures taken in Dealey Plaza from November 22nd, one of them grabbed his attention. A bystander in one of the photos was a longtime friend and associate, General Edward G. Lansdale. Lansdale was a talented CIA man who masterminded various assassination plots for the agency. Lansdale had been placed by Jack Kennedy in charge of Operation Mongoose, which were the attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro, and his appearance here suggests that he used one of his teams to take out Jack himself. Was it really General Lansdale in Dallas? Was he coordinating events for the Central Intelligence Agency? Or was it mere coincidence that Edward Lansdale was in Dallas when the president was assassinated? Of course, the CIA was not the only agency that felt threatened by the JFK presidency. Conspiracy theorists and investigators have pointed out that both J. Edgar Hoover and Lyndon Baines Johnson stood to gain a great deal by the president's death. FBI Director Hoover had everything to gain if John Kennedy was no longer president, as both John and Bobby Kennedy held his future in their hands. Hoover despised the bedroom antics of the Kennedys, but he was approaching mandatory retirement age and could only remain as FBI director by presidential decree. 
But with John Kennedy as president, there was little chance of Hoover ever receiving that decree. With his close personal friend Lyndon Johnson as president, Hoover's chances were assured. No one had more to gain from the assassination of President Kennedy than his own vice president, Lyndon Johnson. Just days before Kennedy was killed in Dallas, Richard Nixon, who was also in Dallas, told news media there that Johnson would be dropped from the Democratic ticket in 1964. To complicate matters, there was a series of political scandals that were beginning to come to light regarding Johnson. A decision that still troubles many today was an executive order signed by President Johnson that locked away an immense amount of assassination evidence in the National Archives until the year 2039. What is in these documents that had to be kept secret from the American people for 75 years? And there is another group that conspiracy theorists put on the list of those who would profit from Kennedy's death, the military. Few Americans realize the immense power wielded by the U.S. military. During the 1960 campaign, Kennedy promised to increase military spending, but once in office, he found out that vital information had been withheld from him. The Pentagon had told him that the Soviets possessed between 500 and 1,000 intercontinental ballistic missiles, but Kennedy found out it was less than 50. Kennedy felt this exaggeration was part of a deliberate strategy on the part of the Pentagon to keep their budget increasing. Kennedy made a serious attempt to bring the military and the intelligence agencies under control. In June of 1961, John Kennedy signed National Security Action Memorandum 55, which basically stated that all clandestine operations by any agency would come under the control of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and thus under the control of the President. Perhaps the final straw for the military came with National Security Action Memorandum 263, which President Kennedy signed in October of 1963. In this document, the President decreed that all U.S. military personnel would be out of Vietnam by the end of 1965. Just four days after Kennedy was killed, President Johnson signed National Security Action Memorandum 273, which reversed Kennedy's action and committed the U.S. to war in Vietnam. The most bizarre part of this issue is that the document Johnson signed was drafted on November the 21st, 1963, the day before Kennedy was assassinated. The discovery of this bit of information set off an explosion of questions. Who drafted this document that was the complete reversal of the Kennedy Memorandum? Did the author know that Kennedy would no longer be president after November 22nd? Did Johnson know about it? and whose interests were served by committing the U.S. to a war in Vietnam. For a variety of reasons, the American military was very upset with Jack Kennedy. He had refused to invade Cuba at the time of the Bay of Pigs against the unanimous recommendation of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He had signed an above-ground test ban treaty with the Soviet Union against their unanimous opposition. And now he was pulling American forces out of Vietnam, which, in their opinion, was turning the country over to the communists. He was making enemies of individuals and organizations of enormous power and unlimited resources. While it is true that any of these agencies had the motive and means to assassinate the president, the key question is still, who had the power to subvert and misdirect any meaningful investigation after the assassination had occurred? During 1963, there was serious talk against President Kennedy circulating within many groups, including organized crime, the CIA, big business and banking, and even the military. It is now known there were many connections among these groups. Once word of the strength of the anti-Kennedy feelings reached the ears of certain members in power, secret meetings were held and decisions were made. To keep public attention away from the real conspirators, a scapegoat was needed. Enter Lee Harvey Oswald. One of the keys in the assassination was the removal of presidential protection that was supposed to be there in Dallas, augmenting the Secret Service. There's probably at least 200 men that would have been there from the 112th Military Intelligence Group. A serious breach of security was slowing the presidential limousine to take the unusually sharp turn from Houston onto Elm Street. The route that makes the most sense for the motorcade would have been to avoid Elm Street altogether and continue on Main Street directly to the trademark. Who made the last minute decision to take the motorcade on that fatal route? Was President Kennedy deliberately driven into a textbook example of a killing zone? Is the evidence beginning to suggest we think the unthinkable?
that perhaps all the agencies were involved. The original plan most probably was built around the idea of one lucky shot striking Kennedy from the direction of the Texas School Book Depository. Other conspirators placed at various locations opened fire on the motorcade. The result was that many witnesses claimed that more than four shots were fired. Governor Connolly even thought somebody was using an automatic rifle. When Oswald was taken alive, it created a predicament for the conspirators. Although he was not a shooter, he had served as an intelligence agent for the United States and as an informant for the FBI. He knew too much. Jack Ruby, who had made local arrangements for the assassination on behalf of the mob, was called upon to deal with Oswald. With just one shot, the conspiracy was secure once again. Within about an hour of the assassination, Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as president. And one of his first acts was to violate the laws of his own state by ordering Kennedy's body illegally removed from Parkland Hospital. The cover-up had begun. In the days and weeks following the assassination, witnesses were intimidated into silence or they died under strange circumstances. Many people in Dallas claimed that this was not done by mob thugs, but by government agents. The facts are now undeniable. Hoover's FBI fabricated evidence, destroyed evidence, altered evidence, and intimidated witnesses. We've been able to sample only a fraction of the evidence that has been gathered by scholars, theorists, and authors since 1963. And the Warren Commission report contains only a small portion of the information gathered by them and locked away. Given the breadth and enormous power of the entities involved, it seems unlikely the American people will ever know the full truth of the assassination of President Kennedy, though there are those who keep searching. In March of 2001, the Washington Post reported that a British magazine, Science and Justice, conducted an acoustical study from the tapes of the assassination. Their conclusion was that there is a 96% chance that four, not three, shots were fired at Kennedy and that one of those shots was fired from the area of the grassy knoll. In light of all this new evidence, eyewitness testimony, scientific study, and all the contradictions with the Warren Commission report, can the American people ever hope to know the truth? Or is the truth that we are afraid of the implications and we really don't want to know? I'm Jim Mars, author of Crossfire, The Plot to Kill Kennedy. Uh, and I'm here today to tell you everything you need to know about the JFK assassination. I've been asked by many people, will we ever know the truth about the Kennedy assassination? I'm here to tell you, yes, you know it now. It's just that most people do not want to deal with it. All right. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the coup d'etat of 1963. Now, if you think that's some kind of wild conspiracy theory, follow me as we go through the factual evidence, much of which has not been presented to the public and let's follow the tracks of this conspiracy. Dallas, Texas in 1963 was just an entirely different time and place. There were still white and colored restrooms and public buildings and, and drinking fountains. Uh, it was very conservative, arch-conservative. Uh, the Adelaide Stevenson ambassador to the United Nations had actually been attacked and spit on by an angry crowd in Dallas who were upset over the United Nations. Uh, it was a hotbed of right-wing activity. Uh, and there wasn't much going on at night times except for the two after hours club, Abe's Colony Club and Jack Ruby's Carousel Club. Here we see a picture of Jack Ruby's club and, uh, and a snapshot made by the club photographer 
of a very suspicious looking character dancing with one of Jack Ruby's uh, strippers, Kathy Kay, on the stage of Jack Ruby's club. That was me as a 21 year old college student. <laughs> and it was the place to go and it was not like uh, the uh, strip joints of today. It, uh, there were strippers, but there were also musicians, live musicians, comics, ventriloquist. It was kind of a last vestige of vaudeville and it was the place to go uh, after hours. Just down Commerce Street from the Carousel Club was Dealey Plaza, a triangular shaped park area on the west end of downtown Dallas where the three main road intersections, Main, Commerce, and Elm, come together under a concrete uh, railroad bridge known as the Triple Underpass. And this, of course, was the scene of the assassination. In this photograph made by an Associated Press photographer, James Algins, we can see the motorcade at the time the shots were being fired. Uh, looking through the window of the presidential limousine, you can see Jackie's white gloved hand on Kennedy's uh, arm as he clutched towards his throat after being struck by at least one bullet. Uh, you notice his Secret Service uh, agents on the car back of him. Only one, Clint Hill, was actually looking at the president and Clint Hill was not even supposed to be there originally. He was added to the Secret Service team at the last minute at the request of Jackie Kennedy, who he was assigned to. You also notice that while Kennedy's Secret Service men are, don't seem to be showing any shock, surprise, they're looking around like kind of wondering what was that, and yet in the white car in the background, we see the door is open, and this was the car uh, carrying the Secret Service men for Lyndon Johnson. They're already reacting. Uh, you'd also notice in the doorway of the Texas School Book Depository the figure of a, a man wearing a kind of a dark model shirt with a uh, open to the navel with a white t-shirt on underneath it. Here we've got a close-up of that figure and uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's mother always claimed that was Lee Harvey Oswald. Today there are others who support that claim. However, the official government investigations have concluded it was actually another depository employee by the name of Billy Lovelady and here we see a picture of Billy Lovelady in his broad check shirt and we also see Oswald with his dark model shirt open to the navel with a white t-shirt on. So uh, it's kind of up to individual interpretations as to who that might be. Of course if it could ever be proven that this was Lee Harvey Oswald then he couldn't have been on the sixth floor shooting a rifle. So this is actually kind of an important uh, issue. This is a photograph taken of the front of the Texas School Book Depository at the time of the shooting by James Powell, an Army intelligence agent. And we know he was there because he made the mistake of going into the depository building and was caught there when the police sealed the building off and he had to show his identification to get out. Now, you may be asking yourself, what is an Army intelligence agent doing taking pictures of the School Book Depository uh, before it became prominent in the news? And it's a very good question and it's never been answered. The color photograph here is a photograph that I made from the sixth floor of the School Book Depository, that southeast corner window, before the sixth floor museum was put into place, so you could actually get to the window. If you notice, it's only about a foot off the floor. You notice the window is only about half open, and there's two two-inch pipes to the left side of the window, creating a problem for someone who needs to either kneel or lay flat and, try to aim a rifle off down the street. But the key problem here is you'll notice uh, you can barely see an overhead highway sign, which is new, uh, is at the location of where the first shots reached the presidential limousine. And as you can see, there's a tree intervening in the line of sight. A tree is an evergreen tree, uh, a oak tree, live oak tree. It stays evergreen year round. And uh, it was in full leaf leaf that day and stays leafy pretty much all year. Uh, you could not get a line of sight into the center lane from that sixth floor window uh, in 1963. To the right of this picture are uh, two photographs, one of the Warren Commission showing the what they said was the sniper's nest, how the boxes were arranged, and yet a Dallas News photograph taken that same day shows a whole different configuration. All of the evidence is in total disarray. 
the three shell cases that were found, according to a uh, news photographer, uh, one of the police officials took them in his hand, showed them to the camera, and then just tossed them back on the floor. So their, their position it being used as evidence is irrelevant. Uh, same thing with the boxes. They were moved around. In fact, uh, the f official photographer for the government, uh, a man by the name of Studebaker, testified that as late as Monday following the Friday assassination, he was still moving boxes around and taking different shots up on the sixth floor. So the physical evidence is already, it was already in disarray. In this photograph, we see the arrows pointing to the various uh, witnesses to the assassination and uh, we, we, we more on them later, but you can see there was not very many people uh, in the western end of Dealey Plaza. This is kind of interesting, particularly where we see moving people in the foreground moving along the grassy area in the median uh, of the park there. Uh, they were kept away from this area for some time by police that said no one was allowed in that area, and it was only after the motorcade began to arrive that people filtered down from Main Street and uh, Commerce Street and moved into that area. And I've often wondered why is it that they didn't want people standing in that area because the whole purpose of the visit was to see uh, and, uh, the president and to welcome him to Dallas. And uh, the only re possible reason I can think of of keeping people off the south uh, curb of uh, Elm Street was that somewhere someone knew that bullets might be impacting there and they didn't want a, a, a civilian to be hit by a stray bullet which would then cause a, a more detailed investigation there in Dallas. Here we see Kennedy approaching the Stimmons Freeway sign and he's waving and everything seems to be okay. As he passes from view of the camera of Abraham's intruder, uh, he is struck. Uh, in this photograph, as he emerges from the sign, you can see he's already clutching towards his throat. He's been struck by a bullet. You also notice the circles. There's a man with an umbrella who begins pumping an umbrella and a dark-complected fellow who raises his arm. These men were uh, perpendicular to the car, and we feel like that they were uh, signalmen. Uh, it was a visual signal to shooters that uh, they could not tell that the president was dead and more shots were called for. In the upper left, you can see the two men with the umbrella at the bottom of the sign, which he begins to pump up and down as Kennedy gets opposite him. Then these two men who apparently were not associated with each other, nevertheless go and sit down beside each other on the curb. Uh, and in the picture uh, in the bottom, uh, it certainly appears like the dark complected man uh, has uh, something under his jacket, perhaps a weapon, perhaps something else. Um, the something else might be a radio because in these pictures, and keep in mind these are blurry because they're just in the background of photographs. Nobody thought to actually take their pictures. But we see the dark complected man holding something up to his face and an antenna sticking out from behind his head, uh, apparently talking on a radio. Uh, they, in the bottom left, we see him get up and stick the radio back into his pocket and saunter off towards the triple underpass while the rest of the crowd are rushing up the grassy knoll where the, all the people in that end of the plaza said the shots came from. Uh, not shown here is the umbrella man who takes one look at everybody rushing up the knoll and then turns and walks the other way. Here is a shot about the time of the fatal headshot. Uh, in the red coat is Jean Hill, a witness, and next to her is Mary Mormon, who is taking a very uh, crucial photograph right at this moment. Uh, across the way on the steps of the grassy knoll, we see Emmett Hudson, the groundskeepers for that area, who said the shots came from up behind him where the police patrols were, although there were no policemen officially stationed uh, in that area. Also notice that the only Secret Service agent to respond to the shooting was Clint Hill, who was assigned to Jackie Kennedy and not even supposed to be on this trip. Uh, and he rushes up to get on the back of the car. This is a frame from the famous Zapruder film and it shows Jackie Kennedy crawling out on the rear deck of the car. There's been a lot of misinformation about this action. 
Uh, it's been said she was trying to escape the shooting. It's said she was trying to help Clint Hill get on the car. None of this is true. The truth is, based on her testimony, as well as uh, the testimony of a doctor and nurse at Parkland, was that she crawled on the rear deck of the car under her own uh, volition, reached out and picked up a piece of the president's head. Uh, she still and crawled back into the car under her own power. Clint Hill was doing all he could do to hang on to the car that was beginning to accelerate. She still had this piece of skull in her hand at Parkland Hospital and when a doctor approached her quite pathetically said, here, will this help, and offered it to the doctor. Uh, why the misinformation about this? Uh, because uh, if she picked up a piece of his head on the rear deck of the car, that indicates a shot from the front, the grassy knoll. Various people in the motorcade, including uh, John Conley's wife and Senator Ralph Yarborough, others have told me they smell gunpowder as they pass through the lower end of Dealey Plaza and into the triple underpass. Uh, others reported seeing a puff of white smoke drifting off the grassy knoll uh, behind the picket fence. Uh, the debunkers say, no, that couldn't happen. Modern rifles don't smoke. Well, they do, especially if they're freshly oiled and that there couldn't have been any smoke that day. And yet here we see a frame from a, uh, a news photographer that clearly shows the puff of smoke drifting off the grassy knoll. Again, more evidence of a shot from that direction. Uh, at the bottom you see a, from a film the number of people that are rushed to the grassy knoll. They all, everyone in that end of the plaza said they believe that's where the shots came from. Behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll, everything was just chaotic. Uh, people poured back in there and they were all looking around. Um, Jean Hill, who was one of the first ones to lead the rush up the grassy knoll, said she was looking for someone running with a gun. Instead, she said all she saw was uh, some policemen and, and railroad workers, although there were no policemen officially stationed in that area at that time. But this crowd of people rushing up to the back end of the knoll uh, obliterated any potential evidence. The railroad workers on the bridge said they thought a shot came from behind the picket fence and they rushed around there said, but, and they found footprints uh, near the fence with cigarette butts as though somebody had stood there for some period of time. But yet most of this got obliterated when the crowd showed up and the Warren Commission, the government investigations have all just ignored it. Not only were policemen seen on the grassy knoll, but also men were encountered in suits and ties who showed Secret Service identification and identified themselves as Secret Service agents, although there were none officially stationed. All of the Secret Service agents were either already at the trademark where Kennedy was to make a noon speech uh, or traveling in the motorcade. So who were these men with Secret Service identification that were good enough to fool Dallas police officers? That, an that question has never been adequately answered. Today we are beginning to see documentaries that present um, computer analysis of the Kennedy assassination and oh they can prove this, they can prove that, they can prove that Oswald could have been the only lone gunman. But let's face it, uh, computer analysis is only as good as the information that goes into it. It's the old garbage in, garbage out axiom and uh, unfortunately we've had garbage in. And uh, what am I talking about? Okay, to have an adequate computer analysis of the Kennedy assassination would require absolutely correct uh, data uh, from Dealey Plaza. The topography, the elevations, the distances, and this was done. On the Monday following the Friday assassination, Life Magazine hired uh, Dallas surveyor Robert West and his associate Chester Brenneman to uh, take still frames of each frame of the Zapruder film and then do survey work in Digby Plaza measuring all the distances, elevations, etc. This was done. 
Both of these men told me they did not feel like the assassination could have been done by one man. Later, in the spring of 1964, both men again performed survey work for the Warren Commission, the government's official investigation. And what they found was pretty amazing. This is a copy of their original plat map for Dealey Plaza that was done for the Warren Commission in the spring of 1964. And uh, Chester Brenneman gave me a copy of it. As you can see, they've marked a yellow mark on the curb. There were two yellow swashes on the curb of the south side of Elm Street, which doesn't make any sense if it was there to say no parking, then the whole curb should have been painted yellow. Instead, there were just two little brief stripes. And what happened right in between them? The fatal headshot. Uh, some uh, of the researchers believe these were visual markers to aid snipers in, in targeting the, uh, the president inside of this kill zone. Uh, it was marked on this map. Uh, further up we have a, uh, something marked that says the uh, area of where a bullet struck the curb. They marked this extraneous bullet. They also marked where the first uh, shots took place and made a note that said this area hid behind tree for any shot from depository as of this date, May 1964. So the surveyors clearly showed that uh, assassination could not have happened as the government claims with Lee Harvey Oswald, three shots from the school book depository. And yet when the Warren Commission published this version of the survey map, they had deleted all of these references. That's suppression of evidence. Worse than that, we see here that the Warren Commission altered their numbers of the frame numbers from the Zapruder film. Well, this throws the whole survey into question. This means that any computer analysis made from the uh, data presented by the Warren Commission is not correct, which means it doesn't prove anything. Lieutenant Jack Rebel was the intelligence officer for the Dallas Police and uh, According to his testimony, he left the Texas School Book Depository, rode back to the Dallas Police Station with a military intelligence agent, a man from the Office of Naval Intelligence. And upon arriving at the police station, he met with FBI agent James Hostie, who had been in charge of Oswald's case. No telling what he learned from both these men, but what we do know is he then went and immediately made out this report which is a list of the employees of the Texas School Book Depository. Heading his list is a Harvey Lee Oswald of 605 Elsbeth. Now, Lee Harvey Oswald had only lived at 602 Elsbeth, and this address could not be found anywhere on his employment records at the Texas School Book Depository. This, he had lived there in the fall of 1962. So where did Jack Revel get this information? At the time of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, they interviewed a Colonel Robert Jones of, uh, of the uh, Fourth Army uh, Command out of San Antonio, and he told that on the day of the assassination, he got word from Dallas that they had arrested a suspect, and his name was Alex James Hydell. And he said he went to the Army military intelligence files and found a Alex James Hydell who cross-referenced to a Harvey Lee Oswald of 605 Elsbeth. So this was a mistake that had been made in military intelligence files and what it tells us is that it was the U.S. military who tipped off the Dallas police as to the identity of their suspect. So about an hour and a half after the 12.30 p.m. shooting on Friday, November the 22nd, uh, they got a, the police got a call that the, someone had sneaked into the Texas Theater in South Dallas. And they rushed out there with squad cars, assistant district attorney, FBI people, and even men who identified themselves as CIA. And we see our first uh, picture of the key suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald. So the slightly built Lee Harvey Oswald was taken into custody and taken to the Dallas police station. 
When he arrived at the police station, he had two sets of identification on him. One said he was Lee Harvey Oswald. The other said he was Alex James Hydell, as we can see from this Selective Service card, which apparently is some sort of phony document because the Selective Service cards at that time did not have photographs on them. So this is something that was put together. Um, the police were saying, well, you know, who are you? And Oswald was being uncooperative. He said, essentially, you're the cops. Figure it out. But we now know that at that exact time, less than two hours after the shooting, FBI Director Jagger Hoover is on the telephone to Attorney General Robert Kennedy saying, we have our man in Dallas. It's Lee Harvey Oswald. He's an ex-Marine. He defected to Russia. He's a mean-spirited individual in the category of a nut. So Hoover already had the lone nut scenario worked out less than two hours after the shooting at a time when the Dallas authorities weren't even certain of who they had in custody. Circumstances can't lie. Circumstances are the circumstances, and although this is circumstantial evidence, I think it's clear that somebody in position of authority knew more about what was happening than uh, the Dallas authorities or the media or the public at that time. When it comes to the idea of uh, more than one Oswald, you really get into a morass, and yet there is clear evidence that at the very least someone was impersonating Lee Harvey Oswald uh, leading up to the time of the assassination. Uh, in this document, uh, dated uh, June 1960, this is three years before the assassination, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was personally aware of Lee Harvey Oswald and sent this memo to the Security Division of the State Department warning that an imposter might be using Oswald's birth certificate. In other words, someone had substituted themselves for Oswald. Uh, this is very, very uh, important. Here we see a composite of photographs of Oswald. The top four uh, are the two, first two are pictures of Oswald about the time he entered the Marines. Uh, the second two pictures are pictures supposedly taken of Oswald in Russia, and the bottom four pictures are all of the Oswald who returned to the United States. One, uh, two of them are his passport photographs, one his arrest photograph from New Orleans, and finally uh, at the lower right is his uh, arrest uh, photograph taken in the Dallas Police Headquarters. As we can see, the fo bottom four pictures, this, this fellow all pretty much looks alike. But the guy on the top doesn't quite look right. The Warren Commission uh, published this photograph of Oswald, and they said taken about the time of his uh, attempted defection to Russia. Uh, as we can see, it's really an odd-looking photograph uh, because we see the light source coming from his uh, right with heavy shadow on the left side of his face, and yet look behind him on the wall, his shadow goes to the right as if there was a light sh source from the left. One shoulder seems broad and the other shoulder is very slopy. Uh, and there's an odd notch in his hairline. The eyebrow and the side of his mouth on, on his right side appears to be retouched or painted in. And when you draw a line down through this uh, the picture, it seems like it's a composite picture of two separate individuals. Uh, Lee Oswald on the right and Harvey Oswald on the left. This was a common practice among the intelligence operatives uh, to combine photographs like this so that uh, someone who's impersonating someone can pass through customs and, and uh, surveillance uh, and they look pretty close to the original person. Here again we see evidence that these photos have been faked of two different people. We see the Moscow photograph on the uh, right and on the left we see a, the mince photograph and we see the same problem. Uh, they seem to be of two separate people and yet when combined we have a person that looks somewhat like Lee Oswald. Uh, at the bottom center we have 
to the photographs, one when he was in the Marines and one later in Russia. And when you match up the eyes, nose, and mouth to the proper proportions, you find one of them is shorter than the other. And this was confirmed by his medical records in the Marines, which showed Oswald to be 5'11", and yet at the autopsy, it showed him to be 5'9". Even his own mother in 1967 asked to have the grave exhumed, uh, questioning uh, marks and scars on the body and questioning the identity of the person in the grave, and she was not the only one. Paul Grudy, who was the funeral home director who buried Oswald, told me that about a week after they buried Oswald, a Secret Service representative showed up, was asking him questions about scars, marks on the body, and one of them finally commented that, uh, we don't know who we have buried in that grave. So there's considerable doubt over the identity of the man uh, identified as uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. A cover-up of this crime began almost immediately, even before the sh echoes of the shots died away. Here we see the limousine at Parkland Hospital. The top has been placed back onto the limousine. You see a bucket of water there. They were washing off the seats. Uh, they destroyed this as evidence. It should have been left alone. The car then was sent on orders of Lyndon Johnson off to be rebuilt before there was any forensic study made of the car. Uh, it was bulletproof glass was put in it and it was painted black and it is now on display uh, in Dearborn, Michigan. But ironically enough, the new president, Lyndon Johnson, refused to ride in it. What I consider a smoking gun uh, is the testimony of an FBI fingerprint expert named James C. Cadigan. Uh, someone altered this official statement and testimony, and it's interesting to see why. It also explains why so much of the evidence is in controversy. In his testimony, James Cadigan was asked uh, why a Exhibit 820 was not desilvered. It's a process for bringing out uh, fingerprints on various things, and he replied, um, I could only speculate. And they said yes. And he went on to say that there, uh, the, all of the evidence was taken from the Dallas police the night of the assassination against the wishes of the Dallas police. Uh, Captain Fritz, who was in charge of the investigation, said, well, I need to get people to identify the weapons. I need to talk to people about this evidence. And how can I do that when you take it away from me? But they sent it all to Washington. And according to Cadigan, there was a huge uh, number of, of uh, higher echelon FBI officials and security people pouring over this evidence that whole weekend. Police Chief Curry said that uh, they wanted the evidence up in Washington, the laboratory, and, and uh, Captain Fritz said, oh, I need to get some people to try to identify the gun, to try to identify the pistol and these things. If it's in Washington, how can I do that? And he said, uh, he said, but somebody in high authority was requesting this, and we finally agreed as a matter of trying to cooperate with the Federals. Uh, then Chief Curry said to the Warren Commission, he says, as far as I know, we have never received any of that evidence back. It's still in Washington, I guess. J. Lee Rankin, the chief counsel of the Warren Commission, said, yes, the commission is still working with it. So the government kept all the evidence to begin with, totally illegally, totally against all the procedures at that time, because there were no laws, uh, federal laws, about assassinating the president. On uh, November the 26th, several days after the assassination, there was a meeting held with the Dallas Police, Dallas County Sheriff's Office, and the FBI, and it was announced that they had asked the FBI to come into the case. And on this day, this is when it became the official government evidence. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the FBI had all the evidence beginning the night of the assassination and for three full days before it became the official evidence. They could have taken anything out. They could have put any fabricated evidence in. There was no oversight and no legal chain of evidence and custody. Uh, this 
is the cause for the controversy that still rages over the evidence in the Kennedy assassination, and it could all be laid at the feet of federal officials. All of the evidence was in the hands of the FBI with no public oversight, no chain of evidence. Uh, is only one example of evidence that was skewed, changed, altered, fabricated. Here we see uh, on the right the commission exhibit 2003 of the Warren Commission, which is the Dallas Police Evidence Sheet. This is the sheet that listed all the evidence that they had in the assassination. And you'll notice at the era that they only, that it shows three spent rounds were found. Okay, three shots, three spent rounds. And at the bottom, it's blank there, except for the page number. On the left is the Dallas Police Evidence Sheet as recovered in Texas. And it shows spent rounds found two. They only had two rounds. And at the bottom it says paraffin test made on Oswald was positive on both hands, negative on the face. As soon as, the, as Oswald arrived at the police station, they put paraffin on his hands and face to see if they could detect nitrates or gunpowder. I have copies of that report and it states that there were no gunpowder on his hands or face and only traces of nitrates on his hands, but none on his face. This is pretty good evidence that he had not fired a rifle that day, because if he had fired that loose bolt Mannlicher Carcano in 5.6 seconds, uh, he would have had to have done it from a rifle position like this. He couldn't lower it. it had to be like this, and he had to cock it like that to stay within the time frame. And when he pulled the bolt back, he would have been hit with gases, nitrates, and gunpowder uh, from that rifle. And yet, uh, just uh, less than two hours after the shooting, he, uh, there was no trace of that on his cheeks. But again, we see in the evidence sheet presented to the public through the Warren Commission, instead of explaining this or explaining why there was no gunpowder on his face or hands, they simply delete that. They hide the evidence away from you. Here we see what appears to be two identical FBI reports. They both have the same file number and dated the same date and signed by the same agent, uh, Vincent Drain. One says that the wrapping paper found at the book depository matches the same paper that uh, they said was used as a gun case to bring the rifle into the depository by Oswald. Since Oswald worked at the depository and had access to the wrapping paper there, this is incriminating evidence to show that Oswald may have gotten the paper from the depository, his place of work, and used it to bring in the rifle. However, the other document says that the paper does not match <laughs> the paper bag that they said contained the rifle. So now, which one of these documents is correct? Do they say the exact opposite thing? When FBI was questioned about this back in the 1980s, a spokesman said, well, the one that says the paper did not match is a phony document, which leads me to wonder how many other phony documents are in FBI files. Uh, again, another clear example of chicanery taking place over the evidence in the Kennedy assassination. Here we have the evidence as presented in the National Archives today, and we find that now there are three empty shell cases. Uh, Dallas police said one of the police official carried a third cartridge around in his pocket for a few days, didn't think to turn it in as evidence, and it suddenly turned up days later when, after they had decided that the scenario called for three shots. You notice that uh, three of the uh, cartridges here, two empties and one live round, have a dent on the shoulder of the cartridge. This, they said, was a peculiarity of Oswald's Mandlicker Carcano rifle. The third shell casing that turned up belatedly uh, has no such crimp, indicating it was never loaded into the Oswald rifle. So we just see more and more strange inconsistencies in the evidence. A Ronald Simmons of the Army Ballistic Test Center told the Warren Commission that they could not sight in the Oswald rifle using the telescopic sight 
uh, because it was misaligned and they had to add three metal shims under the uh, telescopic sight to make it accurate enough to test. The Warren Commission even graciously showed us photographs of the three metal shims they had to put in under the telescopic sight to make the Oswald rifle accurate enough to test. Couldn't have hit anybody with it. This is a photograph of the, of the evidence they had against Oswald, including up here in a black circle, his Minox spy camera, uh, which carried a five-digit serial number, which meant it was not commercially available in the United States. So the question remains is what intelligence service issued him uh, a small Minox camera, commonly known as a spy camera. In the lower uh, left-hand corner, you notice a photograph of the back of General Walker's house, who the government says Oswald took a shot at in the spring of 1963. And you'll notice that there was a car parked there, and although you cannot read it, it's very small, you can see that there was no uh, hold or destruction to this photograph. Yet, when the Warren Commission uh, published this photograph, somebody had punched a hole in the license plate so that you couldn't read the license plate and find out whose car this actually belonged to. And this hole was punched while this photograph was in official custody. Uh, this is destruction of evidence and under our legal system is considered a crime. Probably the strongest piece of evidence that convicted Oswald in the minds of the public was the fact that on Monday night, uh, after the Friday assassination, Henry Wade, the district attorney of Dallas, mentioned to the news media, says, uh, oh, have I said we found his fingerprints on the rifle? Well, fingerprints on the rifle, that's, you know, pretty well cinched it in the public's mind. But let's take a close look at this serious piece of evidence. Again, all of the evidence, including the rifle, was taken from Dallas the night of the assassination and sent to Washington and to the FBI. The next day, under this document, signed by Jagger Hoover himself, it clearly states, no latent prints of value were developed on Oswald's revolver, the cartridge cases, the unfired cartridge, the clip of the rifle, or the inner parts of the rifle. So in other words, Saturday, following the Friday assassination, there were no fingerprints available on that rifle. On Sunday, the rifle was shipped back to Dallas. On Monday morning, it was taken by two FBI agents to the Miller Funeral Home in Fort Worth where they were preparing Oswald for burial. According to the funeral home director, Paul Grudy, who has publicly stated this, uh, they, he was there and present when the FBI put Oswald's dead hand on the rifle. In fact, he told me he had a hard time getting the fingerprint ink off of Oswald's dead hand in time for the burial. And that evening, Henry Wade says, have I mentioned we've got his fingerprints on the rifle? Again, serious question about so-called hard evidence. Even when it came to the official result, the government investigation was also skewing the evidence, shading the testimony, and uh, according to this memorandum from uh, uh, attorney Albert Jenner to the chief counsel, uh, J. Lee Rankin, he says, our depositions and examination of records and other data disclose that there are details in Mr. Eli's uh, memorandum which will require material alteration and, in some instances, omission. So they're admitting here that they're changing, altering things, and that they're leaving out uh, facts and data about Oswald's background. So much for a competent, in-depth investigation. So with so much evidence missing, altered, uh, changed, no telling what, nevertheless the Warren Commission concluded that one shot struck Kennedy in the back of the neck, passed through, did not strike any bone, went on to strike Governor Conley, causing seven wounds of these two men, removed the slug, uh, you know, was recovered intact from a stretcher in Parkland Hospital. The second shot missed, and the third shot struck Kennedy in the right side of the head, killing him. That was the official version, and actually remains the official version, although the House Committee 
1980 concluded that there was at least one shot from the grassy knoll, but it probably missed. So you can see the confusion now over what's happened, in it, and this confusion can all be laid at the feet of federal officials. Kennedy was never shot in the neck. How can I say that? Well, here is the official autopsy report, which clearly states a second wound occurred in the posterior back at about the level of the third thoracic vertebra. Well, that's below your shoulder blades to the right of the baseline. Uh, and by the way, that's signed by Dr. George Berkeley, Kennedy's personal uh, physician. Here on the autopsy face sheet, uh, on the left, we see the bullet mark in the back, uh, to the right of the backbone below the shoulder blades. But you notice the bottom left-hand portion of this uh, diagram is, is blank. Uh, and that has allowed them to argue that this is just a sketch and it's not to scale and it's not in proper proportion and actually the wound was much higher uh, up on the neck. And yet, if on to the right, you see the original document and it was marked verified by his personal physician, Dr. George Berkeley. Again, more cover-up of important and critical uh, information. The two things they could not alter are the bullet holes in his jacket and the bullet hole in his shirt, which are now still available in the National Archives. And they locate the wound exactly where the autopsy said, third thoracic vertebra below the shoulder blades to the right of the backbone. Now it was argued that, well, he was waving and the shirt and his coat jacket rode up and therefore the bullet hole was actually uh, much higher than it shows on the jacket. But hey, the same bullet hole is on the shirt and your shirt doesn't rise up no matter how much you want to raise. So these are all specious arguments trying to explain why there was a, a bullet hole in the neck and not in the back. But to simply go back to some of the testimony of people who were there, we find that the autopsy doctor, uh, Dr. Humes, said a bullet hole located below the shoulders two inches to the right of the midline uh, of the backbone. We also see from Secret Service agents, uh, Clint Hill said, I saw an opening in the back about six inches below the neckline to the right hand side of the spinal column. Um, uh, Glenn Bennett, another Secret Service agent, testified, I uh, saw the shot hit the president about four inches down from the right shoulder. So they all located the wound uh, at the same location as the autopsy, in the back. So please understand, Kennedy was never shot through the neck. And that, of course, destroys the single bullet theory. And if the single bullet theory does not hold up, then the lone assassin theory does not hold up. So in this diagram, if we take the actual point of the back wound, uh, third thoracic vertebra, and connect it to the throat wound at the Adam's apple in front, we've got an upward trajectory, which makes no sense because uh, supposedly the assassin was uh, 60 feet in the air shooting downward. Uh, perhaps this is a new conspiracy theory, the uh, hidden assassin in the trunk of the car, but I don't think so. But it just shows the disarray of the evidence in this case and the fact that none of this is ever adequately presented to the public. Where did the idea come from that Kenny was shot through the neck and not in the back? It came from Gerald R. Ford, our only unelected president. He was appointed vice president by Nixon, and then when, uh, when a a Spiro Agnew resigned under threat of prosecution, and then when, uh, with the promise that when Nixon was uh, about to be impeached, uh, he pardoned him of all crimes. And so Gerald Ford, who was a member of the Warren Commission, uh, ordered the authors of the Warren Commission report to change the wording from Kennedy was shot in the back to Kennedy was shot through the neck. This allowed them to argue that cockamamie single bullet theory. The foundation of the single bullet theory is this slug right here, Commission Exhibit 399. They said this was a slug found on a stretcher at Parkland Hospital, although they never could nail down whose stretcher it was. They tried to say it was Governor Connolly's stretcher, and yet there's evidence to indicate that's not true. Uh, the hospital technician 
uh, Daryl Tomlinson, uh, said, I'm not going to say it came from that stretcher. In fact, he said quite the opposite. It seems actually it was planted there. And who could have planted this slug in Parkland Hospital? Well, Jack Ruby was seen at Parkland Hospital about 1 o'clock uh, that afternoon of the shooting. So, and going into the hospital carrying television equipment. So it's entirely possible that Jack Ruby played a role in all of this even before he shot Oswald. In this news clipping, we see that uh, John Conley's doctor clearly stated that he was not struck by the same bullet that hit President Kennedy. But the real proof came in this x-ray of Governor Conley's wrist. And as you can see, there's more bright bits of metal that stayed in Conley's wrist then are missing from the bullet that the government says caused the wound. That's how ridiculous some of the so-called evidence is. So what we have here then is the theory that one shot coming from 60 feet in the air struck Kennedy in the back, third thoracic vertebra, didn't hit a bone but somehow coursed upwards through his body, exited out his throat, somehow twisted around in midair, came back down, struck Connolly near the right armpit, shattered his fifth rib, came out the uh, front of his chest, uh, shattered his right wrist, and landed up in his left leg. It's impossible. It, it didn't happen. But you're expected to believe it happened. And they've got experts who will tell you how many angels dance on the head of a... I mean, how many uh, shots could actually do this. This is a transcription of the Warren Commission meeting for January the 27th, 1964. They were just beginning their investigation. And yet, even at this early date, they knew that this single bullet theory did not work. Here we see their own chief counsel, J. Lee Rankin, as he ruminates and says, well, it seems quite apparent now, since we have a picture of where the bullet entered in the back, that the bullet entered below the shoulder blade to the right of the backbone, which is below the place where the picture shows the bullet came out the neck band, uh, the shirt in front. And that bullet, according to the autopsy, didn't strike any bone at all, that particular bullet, and go through. So how it could turn, and he suddenly realizes, he's saying, how it could it turn in midair and go strike Connolly? And he realizes it doesn't work, so he stops. And that's the end of that. They knew better, but still they came out and lied to the American people and told them that this one bullet passed through Kennedy's neck caused all the wounds. It's a fairy tale. Here we see uh, former Senator uh, Arlen Specter, who uh, in 1964 was a, a young attorney for the Warren Commission and came up with this single bullet theory. And here he is demonstrating how the bullet went through Kennedy's neck and struck Conley in front. And it seems fairly reasonable until you actually look closely. You'll see in the red circle the marked with chalk on the back of this fella, and you'll see that he has to hold his straight edge about six inches above the shoulder to make it line up with Conley. It just didn't work. It didn't work then, it doesn't work now, but nevertheless they say, well, that's what happened. Further evidence of, of manipulation and obfuscation of the evidence comes uh, in the medical evidence. Uh, here we see testimony from all the medical people in Dallas who all said Kennedy suffered a gaping wound in the right rear portion of his head. This would indicate a shot from the front and blowing out the right rear portion of his head. At the time of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, they showed us a drawing reportedly of the autopsy photograph and we see that the back of his head seems to be perfectly intact, but we do see a small, what appears to be a hole up there, uh, and they said this was the entrance wound coming from the rear of his head. And yet, a few years later, when the autopsy photographs themselves became publicly available, we find that there is no hole back there, only what appears perhaps to be a, a little splotch of dried blood and there's even hairs growing through it. So again, there was lies and deceit uh, with the medical evidence. Again, the drawings that the House Committee showed us shows this bullet hole. Now it's no, not in the neck and it's not in the back, it's kind of on the shoulder. Uh, and it is not consistent at all with the bullet hole in the jacket. So it's nothing but lies and deceit. 
most telling of all is this story, which got very little play in the mass media. Here we see Gerald Custer, who was the x-ray technician who took the x-rays of Kennedy at the autopsy. Also at this same news conference was Floyd Reby, uh, the photographer who took the autopsy photographs. And both of these men today say that the x-rays and the photographs being shown to the public and being kept in the National Archives are not the ones they took. So we have again manipulation, obfuscation of the evidence at the federal level. Here we see uh, what purports to be an x-ray of Kennedy's skull and it's, as you can see the whole uh, front uh, right portion of his head seems to be missing and yet in this autopsy photograph we plainly see that his forehead is perfectly intact. Gerald Custer, the man who took the original x-rays, said that there was no damage to his face, no part of his skull was missing. These are fake x-rays. So we got fake x-rays and fake photographs now resting in the government archives. Uh, does this explain why there is so much controversy over the Kennedy assassination? But there was not very much controversy in 1964, particularly after this February the uh, 21st edition of Life magazine, which everybody in the country saw. And we've got a backyard photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald holding a communist newspaper and a rifle, pistol on his belt, and the headline says, Lee Oswald with the weapons he used to kill President Kennedy and Officer Tibbet. Now this was published months before the Warren Commission came out from behind closed doors and concluded that Oswald was probably the lone assassin. This is, uh, this is convicting someone uh, even before they get a fair hearing, but it certainly cemented the idea that Oswald was the killer in the minds of the American public. But was the backyard photograph legitimate? Uh, right there in the Warren report, Captain Fritz uh, tells that uh, Oswald uh, was shown a picture of him holding a rifle and wearing a pistol and he says this picture had been enlarged by a crime lab from a picture found in the garage at Mrs. Payne's house. He, meaning Oswald, said the picture was not his, that the face was his face, but this, this picture was made by someone superimposing his face. The other part of the picture was not him at all, and he had never seen the picture before. A phony picture, a composite picture. Could this be true? Well, we take the two known examples of the backyard photograph and we turn them into a color transparency, one red and one blue, and these are supposedly two separate photographs made with a handheld camera. Nothing should match, and yet when you blow them up to the same proportion, lay one on top of the other, you can see that Oswald's face is an exact match on both photographs. This is an impossibility unless, exactly as he said, it's a composite photograph with one picture of his face pasted over someone else's body. Is there even more evidence of this? Yes. Here we see uh, the, on either side the backyard photograph, which is essentially the same picture of Oswald's face, only done to a different, slightly different angle, and someone has retouched the mouth slightly. But you can see that there is a line running from the one corner of his neck to the other corner of his neck, and we see a broad, flat chin. And yet, in the center, we have Oswald's police uh, mugshot, which shows that Oswald had a little pointy cliff chin. More evidence that this was a fabricated photograph intended to implicate Oswald. But did the federal authorities at that time realize that this photograph, there was something funny going on here? And I submit to you, yes, they did, and here's why. Uh, to the extreme right is a third backyard photograph that turned up 15 years after the assassination in the hands of a Dallas policeman's widow. And she said her husband, the policeman, said, hang on to this, it'll be worth something someday. And we see that this pose is holding a rifle in the left hand, holding the paper up in the right hand. And yet the Warren Commission, Exhibit 37, shows uh, a federal officer uh, posing in the pose of the third photograph, the one that was never accounted for and never explained and never seen for 15 years. This is suppression of evidence, again, a criminal offense.
I make mention of these uh, stills from the Zapruder film for a couple of reasons. Number one, on frame 257, we can see what the back of Kennedy's head should look like with normal shadowing. And then on frame 317, we find what 11 Hollywood experts have said was a painted on black spot on the back of his head. This is to cover up the massive exit wound on the rear of his head, indicating a shot from the right front. This is uh, tampering with the evidence and with the basic evidence, with the Zapruder film, which has been called uh, probably the best piece of evidence in the case. The lower center, we have a blow up of 314, frame 314, uh, which clearly shows uh, the uh, driver Greer turning to look back over his right shoulder, but his hand remains on the steering wheel. What some people have said is a gun is actually just uh, the sunlight reflecting off of Kellerman's greased hair because in the 1960s men were still wearing hair grease. All right, and so uh, I would like to put to rest the story that the driver shot Kennedy. It, it simply didn't happen. Although there is some question as to the activities of the Secret Service because they we've seen they were very slow to react, having stayed up drinking the night before at the Cellar Club in Fort Worth. And uh, the driver Greer, who was the oldest man on the Secret Service detail, testified that he never looked around, didn't even know the assassination had taken place until Roy Kellerman next to him said, we're hit, get us out of here. And he stepped on the gas and accelerated out of Divi Plaza. But as can be seen plainly, he did turn and look back at Kennedy at the time of the fatal headshot. The brake lights come on, the car slowed down, Kennedy was shot in the head, and then the car accelerated forward. Here we see a Polaroid snapshot made by bystander Mary Mormon. Um, right about the time of the fatal headshot. In the upper right-hand corner, uh, we can see Abraham Zapruder and his receptionist, Marilyn Sitzman, uh, making the, his famous film. Uh, and then we can see Kennedy slumped in the car with Jackie uh, kind of bending over him. Uh, but in the background, behind the picket fence, behind the concrete wall, we see this figure of a man. And this is not, has not been doctored, has not been photoshopped, has not been tampered with. This is strictly a blow up of the image in the background. And a similar Polaroid camera has been tested. And it is found that they do have sharp enough detail and focus to get a picture like this. And what we see is this blow up, which is clearly shows a man. You can see his two eyes, his hairline, his uh, right, his uh, left ear. Uh, you can see a white flash in front of his face, either smoke or flash from a gun, and his arms are in the classic rifle holding position, and he's wearing a dark shirt with a similar semicircular patch uh, on the left shoulder and a bright object on his chest, which by computer analysis is shown to be metal. Uh, here on the right is the blow up of the figure that has come to be known as the Badge Man. Next to that, we can see a Dallas police uniform with a semicircular patch on the left arm and the badge on the right chest. Uh, and then we, at the extreme uh, left, you can see a artist representation of what you're seeing here, the badge man photograph. So now we have a photograph of a man firing a weapon from behind the fence on the grassy knoll. The House Select Committee on Assassinations finally concluded that there was a conspiracy because at least one shot came from behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll. And uh, based on two separate sets of acoustical scientists who used sound signatures to identify the grassy knoll as a place for one of the shots. Now, if this was any other case other than the Kennedy assassination, and I tried to tell you that we have a photograph of a man firing from behind the fence on the grassy knoll. We have the majority of witnesses in that area saying a shot came from behind the fence on the grassy knoll. We got a picture of smoke drifting out from behind the fence on the grassy knoll. Uh, and we got acoustical studies pinpointing the behind the fence on the grassy knoll as a source for the, at least one shot then if I tried to tell you there was nobody there, you would think I was an absolute fool. And yet this is the Kennedy assassination and there are still people who seriously argue there was nobody behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll.
So what we see is that there has been a, a tremendous cover-up at the level of the federal government of the United States. And it's this cover-up, this suppression of evidence, destruction of evidence, fabrication of evidence, alteration of evidence, intimidation of witnesses. These are all crimes in connection with the capital murder. And they all were committed at the level of the federal government. This is what transforms what at that time was nothing but another Texas homicide to a national coup d'etat. Now, why would they want to get rid of the chief executive? Because John F. Kennedy was shaking up the status quo. Let's go back and, and look at some of the things that he was doing. To begin with, he forced the steel manufacturers to roll back their price increases that they promised they were not going to do, and they did anyway. Uh, and he went on television and said, this is not right. And the public got with him, and they forced the steel manufacturers to roll back their prices. His brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, was prosecuting organized crime as never before or since. In fact, on the morning of the assassination, he met with his organized crime task force. And then about noontime, of course, his brother was killed, and the task force never met again. President Kennedy uh, also was trying to put a stop to the CIA and the military making raids on Cuba. After the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, they continued to push for another invasion of Cuba. In fact, in the spring of 1962, the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff approved a plan called Operation Northwoods. And this horrendous plan called for assassinating American citizens in some of our cities, setting off bombs in major American cities, hijacking planes and ships, and blaming it all on Castro so they could stir up support for another invasion of Cuba. They probably, the, the ranking officials of the CIA, the military, they did not realize that there had been secret agreements made at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev worked out a deal where Khrushchev agreed to withdraw the offensive missiles from Cuba. In exchange, we agreed to withdraw our offensive missiles from Turkey and pledged that we would not invade or support a military invasion of Cuba, which we have not. But a lot of the lower echelon people were not aware of these agreements, and so they were still pushing for uh, a, an invasion of Cuba. Uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev were also reaching agreements on uh, above a ban on above ground nuclear testing. They put in the hotline to Moscow. They were actually working to try to end the Cold War, which did not set well with the military uh, bases in either country. Kennedy may have also sealed his fate when he talked about doing away with the oil depletion allowance, which was a, a, the bedrock of Texas oil money. Got all the oil and gas people mad at him, the mafia's mad at him, the military's mad at him. And then in the summer of 1963, he ordered $4.2 billion of interest-free money issued through the Treasury Department, not the interest-bearing Federal Reserve System, uh, thus becoming the second president in American history to try to issue money that was free of interest from the international bankers. The first president being Abraham Lincoln, who printed his own greenbacks to uh, finance the war between the states. And I, for one, do not feel like that it was just sheer coincidence that both of those presidents were shot in the head in public. This is a $5 bill, Series 1963, and you'll notice it says United States Note and has red ink on it. This was part of the money that Kennedy issued that was interest-free because it was issued through the Treasury Department, not the Federal Reserve System. One thing that definitely changed with the death of John F. Kennedy was our involvement in Vietnam. Here we see National Security Action Memorandum number 263 issued on October the 11th, 1963, just about a week after the Diem brothers were killed and uh, the Vietnam uh, struggle was uh, beginning to reach a turning point. Uh, in this document, it says the president approved the military recommendations contained in the report of uh, McNamara and uh, Maxwell Taylor. Uh, who had gone to report on the situation in Vietnam, and they reported that uh, they, th they thought we had a handle on the situation and that we might be able to withdraw all troops by the end of 1965. 
president approved this and then, according to this, directed no formal announcement be made but to withdraw 1,000 U.S. military personnel by the end of 1963. So Kennedy was going to disengage us from Vietnam. No Vietnam War with the attendant uh, raping of our uh, uh, budget, uh, the uh, conflict between the generations, the, the 58,000 deaths, the people who were maimed, the families that were torn apart. None of that would have happened if Kennedy had lived. But there were people who wanted that war. Just three days after his assassination, then President Lyndon Johnson issued this National Security Action Memorandum, number 273. And although it starts off saying the objectives of the United States with respect to the withdrawal of U.S. military personnel remain as stated in the White House statement of October the 2nd, uh, says it's going to, uh, everything's going to stay the same. Here under uh, item six, we find programs of military and economic assistance should be maintained at such levels that their magnitude and effectiveness in the eyes of the Vietnam government do not fall below the levels uh, sustained by the United States at the time of the DM government. Well, this is a convoluted way of saying we're not going to drop the financial or the military aid to South Vietnam. So in other words, this stopped these pullout orders, the thousand uh, men that Kennedy said he was going to withdraw did not withdraw. The document goes on to state the plausibility of denial, that they could deny what was really going on, uh, damage to North Vietnam, we're going to start bombing the North, we're going to widen the war, and even spread to drawing up plans against Laos. Okay? Uh, it's really fascinating, but the most fascinating thing appears here in this document which uh, was taken from the LBJ uh, library in Austin, Texas. This is the draft of Johnson's National Security Act Action Memorandum 273 which blocked Kennedy's pullout order and set us on a course for full-time involvement in Vietnam. And what you notice is is that this draft was written on November the 21st 1963, the day before Kennedy went to Dallas and was assassinated. Somebody knew the day before that he wasn't going to be there to implement his pullout orders in Vietnam. And instead, we were going to be launching a full bore effort for war in Southeast Asia. One final piece of evidence has to do with President Kennedy's personal secretary, Evelyn Lincoln. Uh, she was at his elbow almost day and night. If there was anyone who knew what his real thoughts were, what was really going on within the government, it was probably Evelyn Lincoln. And yet I doubt any of us have ever seen an interview with Evelyn Lincoln. Why not? Was she hesitant? Was she not talked to anyone? No. Here's a letter from 1994 uh, where Evelyn Lincoln states, as far as the assassination is concerned, it's my belief that there was a conspiracy because there were those who disliked him and felt the only way to get rid of him was to assassinate him. These five conspirators, in my opinion, were Lyndon B. Johnson, J. Edgar Hoover, the Mafia, the CIA, and the Cubans in Florida. Very good guess, Evelyn. She knew what was happening, and it's time the American public knew. John J. McCloy was former CEO of National City Bank, which is now Citicorp, and during the 1930s presided over a lot of loans to the Nazis in Germany. Uh, at the end of the war, he was made high commissioner of Germany and shipped a lot of unrepentant Nazis over to this country, where his protege, Alan Dulles, was head of the CIA and whitewashed their Nazi backgrounds. And then John J. McCloy ended up sitting on the Warren Commission to determine what happened to President Kennedy. While serving on that commission, he stated, It was of paramount importance to show the world that America is not a banana republic where a government can be changed by conspiracy. And that was their objective, is to try to scotch any talk of conspiracy. And that's been going on to this very day, and there are still those 
uh, in the status quo establishment who do not want to mention the coup of 1963. But unfortunately, my fellow Americans, America is just another banana republic because in November of 1963, our nation and our future was altered by a murderous conspiracy accomplished at the highest levels of the federal government of the United States. And that's all you need to know about the Kennedy assassination. As you can see, the evidence for a conspiracy at the highest levels of the federal government of the United States is quite compelling, if not overwhelming. In fact, if you want to name two people who could be considered guilty, it would be Lyndon Johnson and his next door neighbor and old buddy, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI. How can I say that? Can I prove that they ordered the assassination? No, but what I can prove beyond any reasonable shadow of a doubt is that these two men took steps to confuse, confound, and block any legitimate investigation into Kennedy's death. Under our legal system, that makes them accessories after the fact. And there have been people executed for murder who the facts of the case show uh, did not pull the trigger, uh, were not the killers, but they were there. They had knowledge of the crime and they didn't report it. They didn't turn in the true culprits and therefore they were accessories after the fact and are considered under our legal system as guilty as the person who pulls the trigger. And under that criteria, Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover are guilty, but they didn't act alone. There was a whole raft of Americans who had uh, no direct connection to the assassination, but the end result, the elimination of John F. Kennedy and his policies to curtail the power of the banks and the corporations and the military industrial complex and to try to bring the United States into a more uh, peaceful and uh, progressive country, uh, they couldn't stand the idea and they felt like the only right way they could protect the country 